in the UDF talk, please take that into mind. Uh, and we try to provide the best we can find in security to the users in Gen2. And uh, well, this happens before it's accepted in mainstream Gen2. Why? Well, mainly because, let's get realistic, many Gen2 users are risers. Uh, many Gen2 users want to have a speed. Uh, many Gen2 users use uh, F, uh, F and switch loops. And uh, many Gen2 users uh, don't like the idea of being more secure in exchange of being slightly slower. And since Gen2 is about choosing, they also have the chance to choose to be more secure or to be more fast. So, let's start with what's an stack overflow. Please, raise up. Hello. Stand up, man. Put your hand here. <laughs> and uh, keep marking the, the, the end of the, of the line because this is, uh, yeah. So, first, when we want to do a function call, we insert some arguments. Let's say this, for example, could be echo and this one could be hello world. Uh, then we call the function, so we have to add our return address, which is where are we going to continue the execution of our code. And finally, we add some frame pointer and some local variables. Uh, the frame pointer basically points to here, approximately, uh, to the point, sorry, to here, to the start of the stack of the, of the function that called you. Cool, isn't it? So, what's the problem? Well, Swift, please stop pinging me. <laughs> uh, what's the problem? Uh, the problem is that uh, we can, for example, if we have some local variable here that is a buffer, let's say a char vector, start writing the stuff here, like uh, the frame pointer, then the return address, then the arguments. For example, if we use gets, because nobody here uses gets, do you? You better don't. <laughs> well, he does, but he works in a bank, it's normal. <laughs> so. What we do here, instead, is put some random trust in the local variables that we find before our buffer, put some random trust on the frame, point, on the frame pointer, if there is, because we don't care, put an address pointing somewhere around here, put a lot of knobs, which is instructions that do nothing, and finally put our evil code that will remove the system or do other evil stuff we want to. That's uh, the classical stack overflow, but we, ah, uh, yeah. We also have the return to libc, which is mostly the same. I mean, we put some trust here. We put the address of the function we want to get called. Then uh, we put a fake return address because maybe we don't expect our function to be to return if we are using exec. And uh, yeah, some arguments that we will pass to the function and we'll get passed around. Uh, this is the classical return to libc attack, which consists on returning somewhere in the middle of the library. So, what's needed for the attacks? Uh, you need for the classic attack to be able to execute code on the stack, which is where you have your variables. You need to have uh, access to which is the stack address. And you need to have access to the return address so you can modify it and make it go to the stack. And for the other kind of attack, we need, you need uh, the function address you want to call and return access to the return address you want to modify. And well, to the arguments, of course, but uh, if you have access to the first, you probably have access to the second one. So what's SSP? It's simple. We have this stuff here, it's called a canary. Uh, so uh, when you modify it, uh, you check before returning, which is the value of the canary, and if it's different, it's exactly the same as it happens on a mine. I mean. You know that the people that went to the coal mines with a canary? Pop, 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 pop. Yeah, if the canary dies, there is Grisou, and you better get the hell out of there before it explodes. It's the same. If this value is changed, uh, something bad has happened, and we better kill the program before it does anything bad. So, that's SSP. I mean, there is not much, much magic before the idea. What's the problem? Well, there are some functions, for example, in group, that uh, try to write in the stack because they need to, because they are that strange. And uh, then, of course, you might need to disable this function on some code. 
Yeah, we also have pies and pigs. It's not a pics of a pictures of cakes. Uh, it's basically compiling the binary in a way where you can put the code whatever you want. Okay. So instead of saying the code is always going to be here, you say the code will be somewhere around there, and if I need to reference anything in my code, I will do it according to the address where my code is, not uh, to the particular address it will be. And uh, we also have a Fortify source, which is basically doing uh, some operations uh, to detect some software vulnerabilities in compile and execution time, many, for example, improper uses of uh, vectors and stuff like that. If you, for example, know the size of a vector and you know you are having an overflow because you know you are going to write five bytes to a four byte vector, you can say it because you know it. And uh, you will make the program in that case just die when that uh, condition happens. We also have HLR and RAND and MAP, which is the counter side of pi and peak on the kernel side. It's basically, well, let's suppose my friend Promethean Fire here, it's the code, so we execute the program Promethean Fire the first time, and he's here. And I'm the kernel, so I move him here for the next time we are going to execute him. And since it's on different places, if you don't know where he is, you cannot go and run the code. Okay, so, run car stack, it's approximately the same. It's uh, picking a, putting the stack on a random address before uh, answering to a system call. So I'm the kernel again. This guy, as you can see, it's a stack. It's made of food, uh, put on top of... Uh, <laughs> Okay, so the first time we have him here, the next time we have him here. So if the attacker assumes he's going to be here, because he cannot know where he's going to be, uh, the time when he is not here, which is mo the most likely of the times, he will say, oh, I want to execute code here. Wait, there is nothing. I cannot. Cool. We also have non-executable memory. Well, this is quite simple. I mean. We know this is our code, so I pick a, a pen and say to the processor, NX, you cannot exec uh, execute this little piece of here at this data, because as everybody knows, this is what executes the stuff, and this is what the data is held. <laughs> so basically, you just mark some, uh, the places where you don't have code as places that uh, cannot be executed. And you can do also vice versa. I mean, you can also mark places where you have code as places that won't be broken. And that's what comes to our next stuff. It's in protect restrictions. We don't allow uh, users to write and execute memory at the same time. I mean, if we notice this is what does stuff, we are not going to allow anybody to modify our math here in order to do different stuff than what we want him to do. Yeah, this has a lot of problems, and some, I'm sure somebody of you is going to tell me, what happens with it? We need to write and then execute data. Well, yeah, we know it, and you can, and you can disable this stuff on a, on a binary basis. I mean, for example, on Firefox, you can disable uh, and protect if you know you are going to need write and, and execute permissions at the same time. So, We also can uh, rem we also remove the addresses on maps and stat. Uh, if anybody of you has a Linux computer around, you can check in bar proc bar one, for example, bar uh, stat or bar maps that there is information about where in memory is everything. I mean, basically, I'm stats and I'm saying that now Promethean Fire is here, now he's here, now he's here. So well. Now he's here. Now he's here. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> so if the attacker can read that information, then he can try to exploit his uh, process. So we just remove that information. We put zeros instead. So when you read that one, you will find that Promethean Fire is here, no matter what happens. Yeah. So we also restrict access to bar proc only to the owner of the, of the process. Why is that? Well, uh, if you are the owner, uh, if you don't are the owner, you don't have any reason to access any information there. 
I mean, uh, but proc information is things like how to debug the process, uh, the things you saw on maps, statistics. And if you are not root, you shouldn't have access to that information if you are not the owner of the process. We also have a thing, it's called brute force deterrence. So, I have a shield called Promethean Fire. Uh, I know we don't look alike. Suppose for a second it's a clone of mine, because I have done a fork. And uh, you, uh, somebody, some bad person over there, exploits him. And uh, because of the misuse we have explained, the exploit didn't work. But uh, then he requests me another clone. So I make another clone of me here, another Promethean Fire. And since it's going to be, have exactly the same information, you could try, for example, to detect the values of the canary. I mean, you could keep doing tries until eventually you manage to find the value. Or indeed, you can do a thing that is called incremental access. Uh, you keep guessing one byte at a time by sending a buffer that is one byte longer, one byte longer, until eventually you get uh, a proper access. So, uh, the problem is that since he's always the, a clone, he's always the same program with the same information, uh, if uh, something bad happens, we need to prevent that. Uh, or, or at least make it a little bit difficult. So what we do, it's uh, the kernel, when I want to fork after he has death, so I fork, you attack, he dies, I say, I want to fork again, the kernel tells me, hey, 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 hey. Wait a little bit, and then you fork. So basically, we convert what it's, what could be used, for example, as an attack to get complete control of the program in a denial of service attack. Uh, yes, before I continue with the talk, I want to make this quite clear. Uh, we have no magic ballet. I mean, we have no way of making the attack fail always. But we have ways of making the attack at least less harmful. I mean, I suppose every of, all of you agree with me that it's better to have a service that is not running to have a service that uh, it's being it's already controlled by the attacker and executing and executing whichever code you talk him to do please answer it's a question it's an open question don't you think so yeah <laughs> okay <laughs> so we also have a real row and buy now it's basically that if we know for example that uh, this arm of uh, Promethean Fire is going to stay on the same place every time we execute Promethean Fire. Mm, that sounded a little bit bad. <laughs> okay, so uh, we are going to mark this uh, arm as read only so it won't move and it won't be able to be changed. So all the constants that you have in your program, all the references to things that are in libraries, all that is going to be mar marked as read only with our linker. And uh, we are also going to force loading halter libraries at runtime. So if he, for example, needs something in me, and he has a reference here pointing to me, let's say, his arm, since uh, there is two ways of loading lo libraries. One thing is that he can have the reference saying not pointing to me, and then they load me, and he points. Or you can, as soon as, he, as you execute him, load also the library, so you can make the, this point here and mark it as read-only. It's quite simple indeed, I mean, now we have race conditions, prepare, <laughs> come here. So, this works as follows. Matthew, please uh, give a few steps and tell to the public hello. Hello. You need to give the few steps from here, from the screen. Go back, okay. two steps, wait! No, 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 no. You're going to execute this evil stuff that I have to, pay, to pass you around. That's basically a race condition. I mean, it means that I got uh, to the place where you are going to listen to me earlier than him. So instead of hello, I told you do everything. We also, uh, for that, we have a thing that's called restrictions on linking and five. Or uh, it's a really ugly name. Uh, it's quite simple. I mean, if you have things on bar TMP, which is usually a word writable directory, you won't be able to execute them, well, that's TPE, uh, and you won't be able to use FIFOS on there and, unless you own the process. I mean, if the process and the FIFO owner match, then you can use that FIFO, 
otherwise you can't. That way you prevent an evil user to put a FIFO there that shouldn't be there. Or, uh, we do the same with uh, symbolic links in temp, so it's, it's mostly the same idea. Then we have user space the referencing. Okay, get on the chair. No, no, up. Oh. As you can see, here's the high one. It's no god, kernel. Oh. And he has this module that says, you have to execute code there. So, run that module. Yeah, you see, there is nothing there. The kernel fails. It's an oops. Oops, something went wrong. And nothing is executed. What happens if the user says, hmm, let's put some code here. Execute. Oh, I want you to remove the word system, please. <laughs> you see the idea? It's quite simple. Uh, the idea is that uh, since he is referencing to something that the user can control, uh, the user can take over the system and exploit that vulnerability. Uh, so for that, we have a thing called a youth ref that is basically a check before we execute a function pointer to ensure it's pointing somewhere else. <laughs> that I mean, to ensure it's pointing to non-user space, to kernel space. So you basically prevent the kernel from doing the stuff he isn't supposed to. Uh, basically, what we do is actually making sure that this place here, that is the user space, has never anything unless you load it because you need to access it and then you load it again. So, we also have the kern exec GCC plugin. Uh, let's say it's basically some kind of magic stuff, because otherwise we, the task would take too long, that modifies the code before compiling to get the code to work better with, uh, with preventing uh, execution attempts in kernel space. And of course, we have the classical minimum and map address. This is already on on normal Linux, but uh, we have it uh, since earlier, which is basically telling that uh, the process cannot map anything in that particular point that we know it's going to be problem uh, to cause problems unless you explicitly allow the process to do so. There is a permission that allows the process to do this kind of mappings. Okay, information leaks. Ah, that's, the ch that's the easiest thing in the world. See, hey, what's your name? My name is Matthew. No, I can do other things with his name. Yeah. Uh, let's suppose that we, I'm not supposed to know his name. Hey, what's your name? My name is Matthew. No, don't tell it. Hey, what's your name? <laughs> oh, he's not answering. Cool. Hey, can you show me your ID card? <laughs> don't need to, but you understand yeah. the idea. Oh, no, I know your name. That's an, an information leak. It's uh, when you can access some information you aren't supposed to. Uh, just by using a creative way of getting access to it. And uh, we also have data rewriting. It's basically something similar to what happened with uh, the stacks we saw earlier. I mean, let's suppose that uh, our friend Matt here wants to ask me if uh, one user is authenticated. So I'm going to say zero. We are going to do some execution here. And at the same time, Matt is going to accidentally, because of an overflow or something, change that to one, and then ask me. Are you authenticated? It says one. Yes, I am. <laughs> so the idea is that basically there are times in which you can rewrite data that you are not supposed to rewrite, which can be used for some exploits. So for that, we have uh, things like the reference, counter, overflow, protection, eh, another ugly name. But the idea is more simple than it seems. It means that uh, I'm a chunk of memory. So you point to me because I'm reserved. I'm reserved again. You point to me again. No, with the other hand. And I'm reserved again, and you don't have no more hands, so you do an overflow, and you point me with zero hands. Oh, I'm free, as of I'm reserved, because somebody's going to use me. What we do is that uh, instead, we, it work, uh, we work as follows. I'm reserved, point to me. I'm reserved, point to me again. I'm reserved, oh wait, two. Okay, I cannot be freed, I cannot do anything, it's going to stay at two forever. So, it's, uh, as you can see, the ideas behind hardening are quite simple, and most of them you probably can actually apply to your programs if you need them. Uh, 
there is not much more magic before, before testing, except that uh, what could be a data rewriting access or an information leak will instead be converted to a simple uh, memory leak, which is bad, but it's not as bad. We also can limit comparisons on user copy, which we also do. It, it's simple. It's that when, get on the chair. Thank you. Here's the kernel. He wants to access user space. And uh, he says, oh, wait. Since I'm using UDREF, I have to use U a function that tells UDREF will work. Uh, UDREF that I want to access that user space. So you do so. And you try to access uh, to my information. And I tell you, uh, yes, right here, right here. And that uh, owner of the process, you put zero here too, because it's longer. And I, I'm passing you a longer buffer. That's the idea of, uh, of uh, how the vulnerability works. And what we do is that always we are going to do right here, right here. And when I say right here, since we are going to check that it's out of bounds, he won't allow me to do so. We try to generate these bounds automatically, but most of them have to be made by hand. And this patch here accounts for, I think it was at least 80% 80, 80 of the code in the hardened kernel. Wasn't it, uh, sorry? I think it was at least 80 or something like that. So the constify GCC plugin, it's simple. This is uh, basically, uh, if we know something is not going to be modified, or we think so, we mark it as constant, so it's going to be read only. That way it cannot be rewritten. And memory sanitization, well, it's simple. Set up. He is the all powerful kernel. So, I'm a process. I end up existing. I tell him, execute another process. I start existing. Oh, wait, here is interesting information. It's the password from the other, from the other process. So what we do, basically, it's erase memory pages when they are freed. And uh, there is two reasons for that. The first one is preventing process from reading data tables of other processes. And the second reason is that by in that way, you reduce to the minimum the life of the important data in the memory space. I suppose you have heard of cold boot attacks, maybe. It's uh, picking, uh, picking the memory of a computer that has been used down and reading the information in it. We also do the same with the kernel stack. It's, exact, it's exactly the same. I mean, uh, before we return from a syscall, we erase everything. So in case you can read information from the kernel stack from other calls, you cannot use it. And we have a plugin that is called the stack leak, uh, which basically sets an upper bound on the usage of the stack. So you don't have to clean everything. You only have to clean that little part of the stack. OK, the last, uh, another kind of attack is information compilation. It could work as follows. Hey, Matt, um, give me your date, of, your date of birth. One, two, oh. three. <laughs> yeah, OK. Uh, no, uh, what? Uh, yes, give me the name of your first pet. Uh -huh. <laughs> I think you're seeing what I am trying to get. Uh, so the idea oh. is that with that information, I can then try to prepare my attacks. Uh, in this case, for example, if I was trying to take over uh, Matt's identity. Uh, well, what we do is in the first site, you cannot use the mask. The mask is basically a buffer of messages from the kernel. And messages from the kernel should then be accessed by normal users. So only root can access them on a hardened system. We also hide symbols of the kernel. So you cannot know which, uh, which functions do you have in your kernel. So you cannot know which modules do you have loaded and if it has vulnerabilities or not. We also hide the process in the kernel because if you have a process that is doing encryption, for example, you know that encryption is already there. And if there is a kernel bug affecting encryption, you can exploit it. We also add some restrictions on bar proc. So you, can only, so you cannot access uh, kernel information that is there if you are not root. And uh, we also add restrictions to SysFS and DebugFS, which have even more kernel information and more system information. And uh, yeah, we deny betrays on non-readable. Uh, I hate how that sounds. The idea is simple. 
Now, my friend here is going to be a vulnerable version of SUE, which is used to get root privileges. So, since, he is, since I cannot read his code, I'm going to do this. I'm going to execute it with a trace, which means I'm debugging the process. So, I won't be able to exploit this you. But then I'm going to see, hmm, I'm your debugger, so which is your code here? And which is your code here? And which is your code here? Because I'm your debugger, I need to know it. So, in a system like Gentoo, where almost each user might use different flags, different versions of compilers and libraries, which makes, in turn, that uh, the place of staff is different always. This kind of, ben of binaries are marked as non-readable, non so you cannot get that information. And uh, what we do is prevent this kind of uh, exploit that we have commented used by not allowing you to debug uh, processes that uh, are supposed to be run by a different user or a different group. And well, now we have kernel rootkits. Get on the chair. <laughs> this is our kernel. I let's suppose I'm root now. I have managed to get an attack. And I'm going to, let's say, oh, I'm going to insert here a module that will record everything you say and send it to me. Mm -hmm. if, I, if I hide the module, Let's suppose I put it here, then it's a rootkit. That's basically the idea. It's a, hi a hidden module on a running process that you don't know it's there. So, you can get down. We have ways to prevent at least insertion. On the first way, we don't allow random access to physical memory. Uh, yeah, somebody's going to say for the next one. Yeah, we also disallow privileged I.O. XR, XR, it works bad. You cannot use it. Well, actually, some versions of XOR work when you disable privileged I.O., for example, with the Radeon module. But even if that's the case, you can just disable that feature on your kernel, as in disa disable this kind of, uh, of system calls. So it will work. I, for example, have disabled privileged I.O. in this kernel because otherwise I wouldn't be able to give, be given this presentation. <laughs> well, unless you like uh, text consoles, that is. And yeah, we have other attacks. Uh, it's things that uh, are outside of our control. We don't know they are there. Like, for example, there is this VM86 mode that is known, for example, for that famous bug in Windows that uh, was running in every version in Windows since 3.1 to, I'm not sure if it was XP or Vista. Yes. So it's simple. We just not, won't allow you to use this mode. <laughs> And that way we prevent this kind of issues because let's get realistic. Nobody use it. I mean, nobody uses this mode. So why must this be here? We also have a hardened module autoloading. So the idea is that an unprivileged process cannot request the kernel to load a module because he needs a feature that is supposed to be there. So if, for example, uh, let's say carlnet. It's an, it's an invention, I mean, there is, doesn't exist anything like that, which is a cool new protocol that can do everything and that is full of exploits. Uh, it's, it's available for your kernel, but it's not load. And you say, hey, I need a car, let's socket. Uh, the kernel is going to tell you, no, the module is not load, you don't have privileges, I, know, I won't do that for you. And since the module won't be load, then the boogie code won't be there. And we have also CH root jail restrictions. Uh, hands up if you have if you have ever used BSD. Okay, not that many. Cool. Uh, hands up if you at least know what is a CH root. Wow, that's good. So yeah, the CH root is basically that we set a different root directory for a particular program, and that's used a lot in security because. By setting a different root directory, you limit the damage that you can do to whatever is inside that root directory, at least in theory. Actually, it's not like that. You can, you can get out of the CH root and do a lot of evil things, but in theory, it works like that. So what we do is first that uh, in, in hardened systems, you cannot get out of the CH root. We restrict some behavior that would allow you to do so. And the second thing is that we won't allow access to you to anything that is outside of the CH root. And yeah, thank you for giving me the times because, oh, 10 minutes, cool. We are, we are on time then. Uh, so another thing we did, it's also move street info outside of the stack. Yeah, that was done by PAC. 
it's on solid uh, by people, sorry, it's a pack steam. It's funny, uh, he uses the nick pack steam, but it's made of only one person, which is Pipax. So, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I suppose he was expecting to have more people on his side when he started the project. It makes sense. So, uh, the idea is that all the information of uh, who owns a process and stuff like that is not on the stack anymore, so you cannot overwrite it just by accessing the stack. It's somewhere in memory, and all you have is a pointer to that information in the stack. So it's harder to, for example, use the kind of uh, exploit that is known by everybody, like, yeah, I wrote a user ID, I put zero, and I get ac root access to the uh, system. So we also have a consistent multi-thread privilege enforcement. If you use TLIPC, you don't care about that. But if you use normal libc's like QCLIPC, then you need this in order to ensure that uh, when you do a clone call, all the threads will have the same privileges. And yeah, we have the Inter Overflow GCC plugin. It's a work uh, that tries to get uh, to know when overflows is, are going to, hap, uh, to happen or are likely to happen. And when it detects that, well, it tries to prevent this kind of overflows, uh, like the memory leaks we explained earlier, by limiting it and marking the things and seeing it. Well, it works quite well, but. And yeah, we have also active kernel exploit response. It's simple. I'm table user. I'm going to poke the kernel. Poke, 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 poke. Wait, he said stop. No, I'm not allowed to do anything else. <laughs> Until, of course, we restart the kernel, the kernel will know that I was poking him and I start again, poke, 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 exactly. <laughs> so, we also disallow code execution on non-trusted folders, uh, if you want, that is. Uh, it's uh, basically that users can only use code that is uh, in root owner in root owner directories. Uh, if you want, that feature, I mean, you can lock to only a particular set of the users. And the idea is that, of course, if you cannot insert code, you cannot insert exploits. And we have an extended feature of this that is used to prevent race conditions and that can, ca and that can cause you a few heavyweight cases, since it will disallow you to execute code in directories that can be uh, written, but that are not owned by yourself. Yep. Speak a little bit lower. Yeah. Can somebody yeah. please go and hand him the microphone? Because otherwise I'm. See, that's why I have volunteers. <laughs> this may be a dummy question, but uh, what happens if you mount a directory with the binding options to make a fake mount? I mean, just binding a directory to another. Is are you inside of a CH root or here? Yes, because you are speaking about not executing code in not trust directory. But yes. what if you mount um, using bind option a directory to another? So that well, you if you mount a directory, the first thing you should take into account is that usually to mount the stuff you need to be root. And uh, if that's not the case because you are on a user, on a normal user system, like that one that you can put, just plug a USB system, a USB device, then yes, if the, if the executable is owned by root, it will be execu executable by everybody in this case, if, you allow, if the permissions allow it. Yeah. No. <laughs> well, if you do a bind mount, it still retains the inodes of all files, so the ownership of the files is still preserved. In which case, that your uh, the the directories as well are also preserved in uh, the ownership. So most of most of the time, you don't have an issue. Only on the, on a specific mount point, because that is a different one. Mm -hmm. And for that, you indeed re need root access. So. Because you cannot bind as a as a user a bind mount, you cannot do the bind mount as a user. We still have uh, some protection through the TPE. Yeah, so the Excuse me. 
So does the restriction apply to root user as well? It is a till restriction applies on kernel space. It's applied by the kernel to every uh, to every process you are running. Yes. So uh, I see what's the problem. Okay, now I understand you. Uh, you were thinking that we were sp uh, explaining uh, restrictions on CH root systems. Is that is that it? No, but I may not have understood this uh, this point. But okay, well, uh, you see your idea. Yeah, I'll see later. No problem. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we can talk about that later on the roundtable, indeed. So, because we are already short on time. And yeah, we have p trace data runs over non children processes. Uh, it, it's basically that if you are not the parent of a process, you cannot debug it. So you cannot modify its execution. Uh, think, for example, Firefox trying to debug the GPG agent in order to get access to your GPG keys. And uh, we also enforce the number of processes on exec. Which means that, uh, come here, come here, come here. If I make a clone and make him execute su, for example, the clone will still be there, but won't come to me. So if we, if we disallow exec in the case that uh, you have reached your process limit, uh, the clone will still be mine. So I won't be allowed to make newer clones that are owned by a different, process, uh, by a di different user. That's it. Uh, we also have uh, black holing and lacing, uh, that sounds odd. Uh, it's basically some that uh, on the network stack we modify some behavior. So first thing, if you send us a packet that we don't know what we do with, we just discard it, we don't care about that. And the second thing is that we won't wait for the last AC key uh, when we have sent a thin packet, like I want to end the communication with you. And, he, and I have to wait to, for him to say me, yes, I know that you want to enter communication with me. So if we are discarding packets instead, uh, if he says this and there is nobody listening, we don't care about that because we are going to discard the packet anyway. So basically we prevent this kind of uh, exploit by discarding packets we don't know what to do with. And finally we have protections after the attack. I'm going to go fast over, he, over this. We can prevent the uh, users from opening sockets, particular users. We can audit what the users do on the kernel. We have mandatory access control, like Selinux, which is developed by Swift over there, uh, in our, in our uh, site of Selinux, I mean, that uh, prevents you from doing uh, stuff, even if, you, if, even if you are root. And uh, we also can mark uh, red only uh, partitions as red only forever during the whole execution of the process and don't allow the mounting of new, red, uh, of new partitions. And I'm going to go fast over what we did the last year. This is the part of the talk that, she, that if you went on last year, you might be interested in knowing. Uh, no, first, we have uh, extended attributes for packs, uh, for packs marks. It means that when you want to say a process, hey, I want to do this. Uh, I, I need, uh, I need uh, for example, that you disable and protect. Until now, you had to modify the, the executable in order to, for the kernel to know that. Now you can just put an extended attribute to the executable, telling, uh, well, this process doesn't need and protect. They are user, they are user packs marking, so it means that uh, the owner of the process can modify the packs mark. We also have red depth packs. It's a tool that uh, if you mark a library, as for example, everything that links against this library will need and protect or disabled. I mean, we'll need to be able to write and execute at the same, at the same time. It will detect what links with that library and fix the inconsistencies. So every process that links with, with that library, we will be able to write and execute uh, uh, information. We also have clearer kernel profiles. I mean, now when you configure the kernel, you said what uh, if you are using a server or a desktop, if you are virtualizing as host, guests, or not virtualizing at all, and if you want performance or security. And we have fast virtualization, finally! Uh, we have to thank that guy over there who made most of the tests, actually. Uh, it means that now you can use hardened systems with KVM and they will work. Yeah, it, mostly. <laughs> newer yeah, newer systems. And uh, we also have upstream some libff5 patches. 
sorry, manager to do that, which means that uh, with newer versions of Leaf FFI, you can use hardened system. Yeah. And we have this cool new, uh, I suppose you have heard about BPF, it's used by, by Wireshark to execute the, the filtering uh, stuff, yeah, I know, the filtering stuff on the kernel. So BPF basically uh, can be used to feed values that interest uh, to execute code by jumping somewhere in the middle. And yeah, we prevent that by putting the, uh, the constants on different places every time you use BPF. And what's the future? Well, uh, we want hardening, uh, more hardening supported to upstream. Uh, sorry, it's working on getting uh, the hardening stuff we have in GCC on upstream GCC. Uh, we are working to have the last versions of the tool change packages. Uh, again, sorry, there, he's doing that. Uh, we have started a project on integrity measurement, which is made by Swift. So if you have questions, go to him now on the last part of the, on the run table. And we are working on updating the profiles by, uh, to the last version, that is 13.0, and it will be done in six months or something like that, if there is no problems. Blueness is working on that. So thanks for everything. Uh, questions? Any fast question? Cool. <laughs> So, uh, well, yeah. Um, I have a question. Uh, in the, uh, I've been a Gentoo user for a few years now, uh, but never installed a, a hardened profile. Um, I seem to remember that uh, using a hardened profile was, before, a few years ago, was not uh, encouraged much because it might break stuff but in the last few years I've seen some things on planet Gentoo that says that uh, uh, it's coming to a state where it is uh, usable by in normal systems um, well um, when I start when I started uh, with uh, Gentoo Hardened I was a normal user I mean <laughs> yeah it's true this is a desktop system and it's running into hardened. There are some issues still, like for example, there is problems with binary stuff and you need to use the dev packs uh, if you are using a Radeon kernel like us to put the proper markings on, uh, on binaries using OpenGL and stuff like that. But uh, mostly it works out by default and especially on servers, it usually works out by default. And if you have any problem, please come to our chat channel and we will try to help you as much as we can. So for, for a, a normal default user who wouldn't mind meddling with some stuff, you would recommend that they install Harden by yes, default? Yes, I recommend you to install, well, if you have used a Gentoo before, which is your case, I recommend you to try Harden at least. If, and, if you don't, and if you find it's okay for you and it fits your requirements, then use it. I mean, I won't recommend you to use Hardenet because if for any reason you have a strange hardware and we have a problem with that particular hardware or a really strange setup, we are Gentoo people, we know what the strange setups are. Everybody has one. So in that case, I cannot say you use Hardenet, but in general, it works well. Okay, thank you. So uh, we are done, I suppose. We have no more time. Uh, we are going to do now the round table. Uh, the idea is that uh, we sit around, uh, we talk about Hardenet for half an hour. Uh, so sorry, come. <laughs> and uh, yeah, uh, you are welcome to join us and ask whatever questions you have. Uh, uh, if you are not a to user, you are still welcome to come and ask any questions you have on hardening or whatever or how we do stuff. So. Usually, the, uh, yeah, the impact is usually less than 10%. Yeah, right. And uh, what's the impact of the document? On, uh, which are the documents on KVM, for example? Hmm? You, uh, you answered that. You were the one doing the benchmarks. So the question he asked which is the impact on performance for uh, KVM. So the performance impact on KVM is, I'd say, less than 5%. It's very, it's very, very, very small. Uh, are, are you saying host or the guest level? It's just uh, the main node, the main node is up to you. Use up to you. You lose 10% of the document, and after you lose, you lose the guest level. 
No, uh, I'd say f you uh, lose 5%. Nice. Can oh. you repeat the question? Is the performance, is, do you lose 10% from being hardened on top of losing 5% for being uh, in KVM as well? Um, I'd say it's more of a, no, it's, it's less. It's not all it's this. It's usually why, why, is, why, yeah. is low, why is smaller, I mean. Yeah. 10% uh, is uh, what we got on the worst cases we have. Right, you today. very worst case, like if you design code to hit all the slowness. Mm -hmm. So, any other questions? Let's go then by the round table. Uh, uh, media team there, I tap the set if you don't record the round table, so people don't feel like uh, compelled to speak. <laughs>